In our last video, we discussed the basics of diet for gestational diabetes. This video is for women with gestational diabetes or women who have diabetes and are now pregnant. We will now go into more detail on food choices. Pregnancy is a critical time for blood sugar control, and diet plays a major role in helping to manage blood sugar. Since carbohydrates have the largest and quickest effect on blood sugar, our first video in this series explained how to count carbs. Here is a quick review. There are three food groups that are fairly high in carbohydrate. These are starches, fruit, and certain dairy products, mainly milk and yogurt. Other foods like desserts, snack chips, and sugary drinks are also high in carbs. We will talk more about those in a few minutes. For starches, fruit, milk, or yogurt, one serving from each of these groups is about 15 grams of carbs. Sometimes this is referred to as one carb choice or one carb serving. The meal plans we provide are moderate in carbohydrate with about 35 to 40% of the calories coming from carbs. It is very important to spread your carb intake throughout the day rather than eating too much at any one meal or snack. Today we are going to focus on carb quality, fat, and sugar, including how to handle sugar-free foods and sugar alcohols. We will also talk about the plate method and eating in restaurants. Carb quality refers to the level of processing that the food has gone through. Processing often removes fiber. However, we want fiber because fiber slows down the absorption of carbohydrate. This means that if your carbs contain fiber, your blood sugar will not go up as high or as fast. So fiber is our friend. When shopping for bread or bread products, like tortillas, pancakes, or crackers, we want to avoid products made with enriched flour. Enriched flour is white flour. All of the fiber and most of the nutrients have been removed. Likewise, when buying rice or pasta, we want the whole grain versions, brown rice or 100% whole wheat pasta. It's pretty easy to pick out brown rice rather than white rice, but pasta can be trickier. A pasta label that is whole grain looks like this, typically just one ingredient, whole wheat. But a refined grain product typically looks like this. The addition of B vitamins and iron is an indication that the wheat was refined. Oats are always whole grain, but the instant oats have been cut finer, and because of that, they tend to raise blood sugar quicker. Plain, rolled oats or steel-cut oats are a better option. Most snack chips and crackers are made from refined carbs and therefore raise blood sugar quickly. High-fat meals can cause a slow, steady rise in blood sugar. For example, sometimes people will see a blood sugar rise from a high-fat but fairly low-carb meal, such as chicken wings with celery and blue cheese dressing or a large ribeye steak with a salad. The worst type of meal for blood sugar is one that is both high in carb and high in fat. The high carb load causes a quick rise in blood sugar, and the high fat content can keep blood sugar elevated for many hours. Anything that has been deep fried will be high in fat. A hamburger with fries and pizza are both examples of meals that are high in carbs and high in fat. In addition, highly processed fats most likely contribute to insulin resistance and therefore can make blood sugar control more difficult. Highly processed fats include hydrogenated oil, intersterified oil, monoglycerides, and diglycerides. These may contain small amounts of trans fat. Trans fat increases insulin resistance. Insulin resistance means blood sugar is more difficult to control. Unfortunately, trans fat does not always show up on the trans fat line in the Nutrition Facts panel. Therefore, it is best to look for products with a short, simple ingredient list rather than a long list of ingredients with words that are unfamiliar to you. For example, the ingredient list for peanut butter A is shorter and simpler than peanut butter B. Therefore, peanut butter A is the better choice. Sweet foods like cookies, candy, cake, and ice cream are obvious sources of added sugar. 
Many other food products also contain some amount of added sugar, such as cereals, bars, and yogurt, to name a few. It would be unrealistic for us to expect you to avoid all added sugar every single day. Therefore, let's talk about what a reasonable limit might be. The World Health Organization recommends that all people, not just people with diabetes, but all people limit added sugar to 5% of total calories for optimal health. The US Dietary Guidelines recommend all of us limit added sugar to less than 10% of total calories. Depending on your calorie requirement, this graphic shows what 5 to 10% is equal to in terms of sugar grams. For example, if my target calorie requirement is 2100, then my sugar limit would be 26 to 47 grams per day. Now when it comes to blood sugar control, less added sugar is better. Aim for the lower end of the range as a good everyday limit whereas the upper end of the range is more for special occasions. And please know that we are talking about added sugar, not sugar that is naturally found in fruit or milk or plain yogurt. Let's take a look at an example. This label is for a bar. We see that one bar contains 21 grams of sugar. By looking at the ingredient list, we see that all of the sugar is added sugar. There is no naturally occurring sugar from fruit or milk or yogurt. So this one bar is taking up most of our added sugar budget for the day. As you can see, added sugar can add up pretty quickly. Liquid sugar is the worst type of sugar to consume, such as soda, sweet tea, fruit punch, coffee drinks with syrup, or sweetened creamer. Because the sugar is in liquid form, it is absorbed very quickly. This causes a very quick rise in blood sugar. Most sugar-sweetened drinks, like soda, tea, lemonade, will provide about 40 grams of sugar in 12 ounces. 100% fruit juices will also cause a quick rise in blood sugar, just like soda. Sugar-free products are fairly easy to find in the grocery store and can be quite tempting. Please remember that sugar-free does not always mean carb-free. Let's look at an example. This is a label for sugar-free chocolate chip cookies. This label tells us that three cookies provide 20 grams of carb. Let's compare that to regular or sugar-sweetened chocolate chip cookies. This label tells us that three cookies provide 22 grams of carb. So the sugar-free cookies have only two grams of carb less than the regular cookies. Sugar-free products tend to use sugar alcohols as a replacement for some or all of the sugar. Sugar alcohols are sweet like sugar, but they are not fully absorbed. Because they are not fully absorbed, they will not affect blood sugar as much as real sugar does. Our general rule of thumb with sugar alcohols is to subtract half of them from the total carbs. We call this net carbs. It is the amount of carbs that affect blood sugar. Sometimes this subtraction makes a significant difference and other times it does not. Let's look at those sugar-free chocolate chip cookies again. To get net carbs, we subtract half of the sugar alcohols from the total carbs. In this case, half of five is 2.5, so we subtract 2.5 from 20 to get approximately 17 to 18 grams of net carb. Notice this still isn't a big difference compared to the regular chocolate chip cookies. Erythritol is a sugar alcohol that is different. It is not absorbed at all. So in this case, we can subtract all of the erythritol from the total carbs. There is a downside to sugar alcohols. They tend to have a laxative effect. Some people are very sensitive to sugar alcohols. Even a small amount will cause loose stools or diarrhea. Other people can tolerate them much better. However, the more sugar alcohols you consume, the more likely you are to experience that laxative effect. Counting carbs is an excellent way to help manage your blood sugar. However, it can be time consuming and somewhat tedious. The plate method might be an easier way for you to keep your carbs moderate and promote a healthy balanced meal. If your plate is half full of non-starchy vegetables, this will equate to two to three servings 
or about 10 to 15 grams of carbohydrate. This amount of vegetables greatly increases the nutrients you and your baby receive from that meal, plus gives you a boost of fiber. Next, one quarter of your plate should be reserved for starch. This typically would be one to two servings or 15 to 30 grams carb. Remember, we want our choice here to be something that naturally contains fiber rather than a refined grain. The last one quarter of our plate is for protein. Most of the time, protein contains no carbohydrate. Exceptions include breading on fish or chicken or a dipping sauce or marinade that is high in sugar. Beans and lentils are another exception. These are healthy foods and should be eaten regularly due to their fiber content. However, a half a cup of either is about 15 grams of carb. These foods are considered to be both a starch and a protein. For that reason, they could fit into either section of your plate, the protein section or the starch portion. To round out our meal, we could have a serving of fruit or a serving of milk or plain yogurt. Either would provide about 15 grams of carbs. If our meal is portioned in this manner, our total carb intake would be 40 to 60 grams of carbohydrate. So not only is your meal carb controlled, but it is also providing a healthy balance of foods and nutrients. The plate picture is a nice visual to keep in mind when you are preparing meals. This division, a half a plate for non-starchy vegetables, one quarter for starch, one quarter for protein is ideal. However, dividing your plate into equal thirds, one third protein, one third starch, one third vegetables can also be quite useful. Sometimes people gravitate towards higher protein diets in an effort to reduce carbs. That's okay, but I want to caution you to choose lean proteins. This is because too much saturated fat tends to increase insulin resistance, and this results in higher blood sugar levels. Restaurants are challenging. We are often served large portions with more carb and more fat than we might expect. For this reason, it is always wise to do a little homework before going. Look up the nutrition information for the restaurant beforehand. Look at the total calories and carb amounts for the meals that interest you. We want our carbs to be no more than 60 grams per meal. You can also look at total calories for the meal. Ideally, we don't want more than one third of our total daily calories to come from any one meal. For example, if 2100 is your target calories, then you want your meal to be no more than 700 calories, as well as no more than 60 grams of carb. Use the internet to search for restaurant nutrition information or use a phone app. When it comes to carbohydrate tolerance, there is a good amount of individual variation. Some women may be able to follow these meal plans less strictly and still have good blood sugar control. Others may follow the guidelines very strictly and still end up needing medication. This is why checking your blood sugar is so important. It helps you learn how your body is responding to food. It is also important to realize that blood sugar control does get more challenging as pregnancy progresses. This is not your fault. It is a natural effect of the hormonal changes that occur during pregnancy. In addition, stress and illness can also affect blood sugar. It is easy to blame food for high blood sugar, but food is not the only thing that causes blood sugar to rise. I realize diabetes during pregnancy can be a significant challenge to your daily routine, but a healthy baby is the goal, and of course, that is always worth the extra effort.